All right, so why don't we start? Um, and we're going to follow, again, the same format, a short presentation, and then we're going to have some discussions. And the discussions will start to, um, to link together. Uh, one of the things Roman and I were just talking about, and I think some of you may see this as well, is this has always been true for me that getting my head around these ethical principles and ethical questions when you don't spend every day studying ethics, I feel like I get it and then it slips. Like I feel like I have it in the moment of a conversation and five minutes later I've lost the thread. And I think what happens in this week is by having that conversation over and over and over again, it starts to stick a little bit. So one of the things we haven't talked about yet, and this is, you know, Celia mentioned that the Institute changes every year and has changed a lot. The old days, um, the bad old days, the, it was all day like presentations, like all day, like you woke up and you, it was this, 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 this without much of a break and it just was too much. And so it's really been pared down and we've tried to make it more concrete among other things. But one of the things that gets lost is sort of this discussion of the history of ethics, which we're not gonna have, and the history of the Belmont principles and everything, but they are what basically undergirds all of this. And so this is um, a presentation that Celia has given. It overlaps a bit with her slides from yesterday, so I'm gonna skip through some of it and really talk about some studies that focus more on the Belmont principles and some extensions of them, which we've been talking around a little bit without sort of labeling and defining. Um, and again, this is Celia's talk, so I'm going to be a little bit lost as I do it. Um, usual acknowledgments. So these are the three principles that come from uh, the Belmont Report. Um, and, and if you read the Belmont Report, it's dense, it's detailed, but it's sort of the foundational document for all of this. So the first one is beneficence and non-maleficence. Do good, don't do bad. Um, respect for persons, which is something that is without a doubt in all of you implicit and, and why you're doing this work and why you're here and it's, it's embedded in the way you talk about. But thinking of it in the larger context of research is a different question. And then justice, which is extremely complicated when you start to look at the concrete types of work that we all do. So this is going to focus on drug users, but it can apply to any other population that we all study. Um, and, and the conceptualization that Celia is using here is the sort of social vulnerabilities, like what are the risks or the vulner areas of vulnerability for drug users? And there's quite a lot of them. We tend to talk about, for our populations, the legal vulnerability, right? We say, what if someone finds out that you're you know, MSM in Malaysia, or that you're a sex worker, or that you're engaging in drug use, and what happens to you? But that's only part of it. Um, that's sort of the easiest one to wrap your head around at first. But people obviously have economic vulnerabilities. That You're touching on this when you talk about Hopkins, when we're talking about all of us do not have the economic vulnerabilities that our participants have. And so even beyond the level of our institutions, what does that really mean for participants? And what does that mean in terms of um, incentives and things like that? I mean, I'm honestly, I think you all are probably honestly sick of hearing, can we pay drug users and participants? <laughs> Brandon will talk about this a little bit on Sunday, um, where he's done some research on that. But, but there are economic some ways, they're economic issues that allow us to exploit people because we can pay them very little because they have very little, and would you do an interview for that fee or whatever? I mean, this push and pull. Um, physical and mental health, some of the stuff that Alexis was talking about, like when you start to be careful what you ask for, you scratch the surface and you hear these things that we may not be prepared to deal with. Um, whether people are high when you're talking to them, obviously that's a thing. Um, I think we all, can, you know, we, we could talk through that. I don't know that it's such a context that we'll talk about a lot, but obviously we've all figured out ways of, of getting consent from people and, and recognizing that some people when they're intoxicated can still give consent, mm -hmm. blah, 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 we've done that. And obviously social vulnerabilities, you know, we're in their communities and we're engaging with them. Um, even when it's private, we're still engaging with them semi-publicly or publicly in their communities and we're in their networks without necessarily um, knowing it. Right, the example that Peg gave yesterday of the conversation on the bus, like that's in someone's community and you just wouldn't realize it. So there's a separate set of questions that we're going to try to figure out about what are research vulnerabilities. So there's this, this sort of social vulnerabilities when we label or describe people as vulnerable populations, but what are their vulnerabilities in the context of research? And this is 
George Seeley presented yesterday in The Goodness of Fit Ethics, right? That social vulnerability is not the same thing as research vulnerability. So sometimes I think of it as, like I think when I raised your question, the question of your project, what are we adding on top, what are we doing to people on top of the, their already vulnerabilities and what are the things that we might do that add layers of vulnerability or types of vulnerability? So we say that research vulnerability is if we're not fitting ethical pr procedures to, par to the participants, right? Well, we're doing that may be ethical we need to get the, into the participants' lens. What is, what is ethical for them? Because a lot of these things are, um, they're idiosyncratic or they're personal, they're relational, and so it's not enough for us to know uh, we're doing the right thing, but what are the participants' views of that? A lot of you are gonna be talking to participants and asking those things in a future app, in a future intervention of what is ethical for you, not what are my guidelines to do no harm and how am I gonna do it? And obviously, this is, we talked about this yesterday with CABS, we've talked about it today. You have to recognize the agency of the participant to do that. And so a lot of what these projects are, are talking about participants and recognizing them as experts, like your CAB is an expert panel um, that what Alexis described about the participants really being the experts on what they can tell you. I think that becomes more and more obvious and you'll see it on Saturday and Sunday in the presentation of last year's MRPs where you really hear the voices of the participants and then you'll be doing the same thing next year. Spoiler alert. Um, and we all, you know, we're all research scientists. We take the approach that empirical evidence is important. Um, something that I think used to not be controversial may be getting more and more controversial now. And so we try to imply this sort of empirical methodology to something that, that to me at least feels sometimes like it's more in the realm of philosophy. And that's, I think, where, where that slippage occurs and where it's hard to kind of get, um, get some traction with it. So I'm going to skip through some of the, we talked about this yesterday. Um, I'm still used this slide yesterday, actually. So there's issues sometimes in the types of, of work that we do. Um, and these are these types of research we do. We do a lot of ethnography. I always think, I mean, I do a lot of ethnography. I am not an ethnographer. I always think that all of us are doing ethnography and we just forget to realize that we're doing it. Because anytime you're talking to participants um, or you're in the community or frankly you're walking down the street because we're all in these communities in different ways, you're still doing some ethnography. You're still, you know, you're, you can't help but kind of look at your communities and see, you know, IDU researchers always look down to see if there's syringes on the street. Like you're doing that no matter where you are, like it's hard to separate that. There's an issue in some of the work. I don't think this is coming up for us. It's definitely come up in some of the MRPs you'll hear about over the weekend um, on HIV partner research. Treatment research is something we're really dancing around a little bit, um, but we haven't yet necessarily talked about justice. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it in some of, some of the, one of the case examples I'm gonna talk about this afternoon, but it's something, you know, we, we, I think Derek, you touched on it a little bit in terms of who has access to these medications and who has access to these services. That's something that really needs to be thought through a little bit, and we're talking about a lot of studies that engage people in services. How do we incorporate the idea of who, who, I mean, the reasons we're doing these studies with these populations is often because of an injustice, that they don't have the same access that we all do. So this is what we're talking about a little bit, is how do participants view the ethical questions and, and, and the questions we're raising. There's a, this is embedded in a larger question of, of, you know, as researchers, we go into communities with an idea of what's important, and sometimes for those communities, that's not what's important. Most of the work, if you do research in, in New York, and I have not done research in New York City in a while, but the main issue for marginalized populations, or a, one of the main issues, is housing. This is, if you ask people what they want, that will be the first thing. New York, like so many other cities, is in the midst of a huge, seemingly unsolvable housing crisis. And so we go in and say, well, you have this illness that we want to address and teach you about, and they're like, I need a place to live. So what are the participants' views of, of the, the what's important versus necessarily our views of what's important? And you know, the privileged status of a principal, meaning we think something's important, but is that really based? That's not always contextually based. It's not always what you hear from participants. Having a cab, an expert panel, doing the types of participatory research that we're talking about is where you get to that to understand that, that context. And what happens is 
when we don't understand it, and we're always starting from a place of not understanding, and we're always trying to get as close to understanding, we cannot walk in other people's shoes, but hopefully we can get close, is we over or underestimate, certainly we, we inaccurately estimate the risk-benefit ratio, because it's our assumed risk-benefit versus what it is for participants. I think we're talking a lot about giving a lot of agency to participants, but it's easy not to. It's easy to say, well, I need to ask these questions. This is what's important. This, these are the aims of my grant. Before I talk to participants, so I have to do this. Um, and fair access to research. I mean, even with, with all of our different sampling method, methods and the things we do, we tend to not really understand what's fair from the perspective of participants. So what's interesting, and this is a study that Celia did um, with people who use drugs, um, where she gave them hypothetical vignettes um, and then analyzed the, and, and interviewed them about scenarios and things that researchers or participants should do and analyzed that data in terms of the qualitative analysis, in terms of how they reflected the Belmont principles and then a few sort of ethical principles beyond that. So let's talk about, so these were illegal drug users. Um, I mean, these were, were similar populations. The study is a while ago, so it's not, the, it's not fentanyl users, but they were opiate users, injectors. Um, that had participated in research before. So that's important because the questions are about these research scenarios. So the questions are based on people who've been in research studies and would have at least some understanding of the research enterprise. Um, so it was less abstract. We recruited them in the usual sites for drug use research. Here's the demographics. I'll give you a minute to read them. I don't think they're that important. They're just, we have to, you always have to report them. 100% Okay, so then that's what, that's what was happening. That can tell you the years of the study. So she told people, or the researchers told people um, what research was. They gave a definition of research and sort of the research enterprise, and then read these scenarios that you're gonna see in a minute um, to the participants, and then had them give a like it response to questions, and then a narrative rationale for this. So it's like, what should someone do? Do you strongly disagree or agree? And then explain why. And the dating is from the explain, the data are from the explaining why. So here's the first one, I'll just read them. So this is a, a question about legal risk. Again, the sort of low hanging fruit. For months, Dr. Jones conducts street interviews on problems faced by poor female drug users raising young children, including sharing her own parenting stories with participants. Just prior to an anticipated police raid, Terry, a female participant, asks Dr. Jones to hide her drugs for fear her child will be taken away. So we can all envision this scenario and we can all come up with an answer of what Terry should or shouldn't do. So Dr. Jones doesn't know whether or not she should break the law and hide the drugs for Terry. And the question is, in this situation, how important is it for Dr. Jones to obey the law? So this is, this is an ethical dilemma. These types of dilemmas come up all the time in drug use research, right? That you're, in, you're in, in situations where illegal behavior is either taking place in front of you or has taken place or you're well aware of things that, that put you in this position. This is a sort of overt rationale, for, uh, overt example of it. But then she, at, the researchers asked people what they would do and asked people to explain their answers. So I wonder if I should go to the answers first. It might be more interesting to go to the answers. So let's look at case one, which is hold drugs. So here's just a couple of quotes. So in the, in, in the theme of, beneath, you know what, I'm gonna read the scenarios because you guys are gonna do what I do, which is that you read all the answers and then it'll kind of get confusing. <laughs> so here's the second, we'll just read all three. Here's the second scenario. Uh, this is about HIV partner risk. So doctor, this, this is common to all of us in the work we do. We hear this all the time. Um, Dr. Alba hangs out with street drug users, interviewing them about HIV risk through interviews. And this is, this is the example that actually Celia showed the video of yesterday. Through interviews, he learns that one participant, John, is intentionally hiding his seropositive HIV status and having unprotected sex with another participant, Chris, who Dr. Alba knows to be seronegative. So this was, I think, Steve and um, Maria in the video that Celia shows yesterday. Dr. Alba tries to convince John to tell Chris about his HIV, but John refuses and reminds Dr. Alba that during informed consent, he promised to keep everything confidential. So again, we know both parts of a dyad, even if we're not doing a dyad study, because all of our research is embedded in communities, and then we know things about the relationship that puts us in, in an unresolvable situation. 
So Dr. Alba does not know whether he should tell Chris that John is HIV positive, and the question is how important is it for Dr. Alba to keep his promise of confidentiality to John or to Steve in the video yesterday. And then finally, this has happened, uh, this has happened to me many times. Uh, to test an experimental medication for cocaine addiction, Dr. Ross will follow research guidelines and say the best way to know if a medicine really works is to randomly assign half the people the medication and half a sugar pill called a placebo. Mary, one of Dr. Ross's research assistants, volunteers at a clinic for homeless persons who are desperate to quit their cocaine addictions. Mary makes an exception to the guidelines by putting all the homeless individuals into the medication group, okay? So many of you may have had this situation where, where random assignment is not truly random because people use either overt or sometimes almost implicit ways of, of working within that system or working that system. And so the question is, how important is it for Dr. Ross to fire Mary for making an exception to the guidelines? So these are the three research scenarios, common research things that happen. So here's the first theme. The first theme is beneficence, uh, basically that you're doing good and preventing harm, and that maximizing scientific knowledge is part of that, and that where it gets the conflict comes is protecting research participants and others from harm. Okay, so here's, it, it's not about the Likert ratings, it's about the qualitative responses to them. So in the case of should the investigator hold or the interviewer hold the drugs for the person uh, so their child doesn't get take, taken away. Um, one person says, I don't care if Dr. Jones is a researcher, Terry could lose her kid so she should try to help Terry. Another person says, hiding the drug would perpetuate a risky situation for the child without necessarily helping Terry. So it's not so much about what we would do or think we would do in this situation because what we, what we think we would do may not be what actually happens, but that there's multiple ways of looking at you know, doing good and preventing harm that, that are not so much in conflict as, as you can't do both of these things. So how do you weigh that? What do you do that? And it really reflects sort of the complexity of these issues and the agency of participants. In the case of disclosure, um, you know, the, 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 the sexual partner could die from HIV, so we really should protect them. And, how, and it's interesting here and you see this a lot in, in, with research participants that they feel some responsibility, relational responsibility for the researcher. So it's not that the person could die, but also the poor researcher will never be able to live with themselves if they let somebody die. Like I think we sometimes, in maintaining objectivity as researchers, lose the fact that we're in a relationship with people and that we're talking about areas where they're disclosing emotionally and that there is a rapport that sometimes I might be afraid of or unaware of or want to keep at a distance, but here the, the, the respondent is concerned about the researcher, not just about the person who might contract HIV. And then the doctor, the researcher should tell Chris because it's the only right thing to do. Like you could say all you want, but at some point there's a moral responsibility. Um, this is something that can be addressed in informed consent if you think to address it, um, but oftentimes you can't come up with every scenario in informed consent. So. You know, psychologists in the room know what you're mandated to report. Because I'm a psychologist in all of my consent forms, it always says, here's the things I will report. And I always tell anyone who's, who's working on the research project, you become a mandated reporter for these things. So I will violate confidentiality. Suicide, homicide, child abuse is always what the issue is. Um, but maybe you would or would not say if you know someone's HIV positive. Like that's not homicide, right? Especially now. So it's, it's complicated even if you have it in the consent form because the boundaries we draw are not always the boundaries that happen in the real world. And then the issue with the assistant who violated random assignment, um, this would violate the integrity of the study and would not necessarily help the homeless people because the medication's effects are not proven. Um, or she should make an exception because Mary was just break, not just breaking the rules, she's trying to help. So this is what we talked a little about yesterday about almost every ethical violation is well-intentioned. Um, so, so again, you can see both sides of the story. The second theme is, is respect, right? So that participants are responsible, that if you give them the right knowledge, give people information, they can make a decision and they have a right to their own privacy. So rather than read these, I'll just show you them. You can take a second and read them. So this is an interesting flip, right? When we're talking, if you look at the beneficence 
quotes and the principles, it's researchers trying to take care of participants. And here it's more, you're an adult, you consented to a study, you need to protect yourself. Um, so these principles, they don't always support the same thing, they're just a different framework for looking at the same question. So from a research participant perspective, they totally get that researchers should protect subjects. There's even the quote about subjects to some degree protecting researchers, right, by, by Dr. Alba will be upset if Chris dies. Here the quotes, and these are the same study, the same scenarios, the quotes, the narrative is about people need to take care of themselves. Chris should know better. Um, you know. Terry shouldn't be shooting drugs in the first place. Like this, this came right out of the, the current Congress somehow, but it ends up as, as, and what's interesting about these quotes to me is participants are not monolithic, right? They're not the way we might say everybody's gonna have this view. They have different views. If you ask directly about personal responsibility, you get a, a much different type of answer. And so listening for those things, opening up to hearing, not just the things we expect, you kind of get this, and this of course is the value of doing qualitative studies. So then the respect of justice is to try to eliminate bias and make sure everybody has the same opportunities, and then to some degree, and this is clearly the Hopkins pen every university example, making up for historic injustices and current disparities, which are staggering and, and you know, becomes the theme. And so here's the, the question of firing Mary, so just take a look. And for me, these are interesting partly because um, they, re they reflect the, the dilemma of doing research, which is that you know research tends to be time limited and narrow. That's how science works. And then it doesn't really work in terms of addressing these larger issues, and in some cases may perpetuate. Um, certainly, clinical trials perpetuate disparities in a lot of ways. And so on and on, and participants know that. I mean, the other interesting thing about these quotes is, is this is not high-level academic white paper knowledge. This is stuff that everybody is aware of and that they see. And then there's a few other themes that came up in the coding of the interviews that weren't just the Belmont principles. Um, so this idea about research relationships being a relationship um, is really something that comes through. And, and, and you know, everyone who's done an interview and then the participant says, thank you for the interview, because it's been helpful or, or somewhat, I was thinking of it as quasi-therapeutic, some of the stuff we talked about a little bit yesterday, is the relationality between the research team and the participants. And I recognize that when I say the research team, it may not be some of us in this room. I mean, in your cases, the four of you, it is you going out and doing the research, but eventually it's the people that you're hiring and, and putting out to do that work, and you may not have as much of a relationship with them. Or if your research is international, you may not be there in the way the research team is, but there are real relationships that develop. So if you just read these quotes, you'll see some examples of that. So Derek, this first quote is like exactly what you said yesterday. How do you work in a community where you're part of the community and how do you set up that boundary? And you know, we talked about that a little bit yesterday. It'll probably be something that comes up as you do your MRP. It may come up for others, but it's coming up for the participants too, right? Yeah. So it's, it's not a one-way street and, and people will recognize that. Um, and, that is, and the more ethnographic your research is, the more that that's an issue and something that, that is a huge strength of the, I mean, you know, we talk about what will people disclose to researchers, and when there's a relationship, people will answer questions, people will tell you, but that comes with complications in terms of what your role is. You know, what about when someone asks you for money, or the old, like, the examples earlier in, in these things? What, what do you provide and not provide? This also comes up a lot, and I always think there's a lot of overlap in, in ethnographic research and journalism. And so what are the boundaries for a reporter who's reporting on disparities or things like that? Um, I always think of Nicholas Kristof, who writes for The Times, who does these things, where he's in venues similar to venues we might be in, and how does a reporter act? These are, these are when you have relationships with people, how do you negotiate that? And finally, I think professional obligations. So this is a little bit of 
that big question of do we do we have any responsibility to represent our institutions and maybe shift the the perception a little bit is that and this is where it gets really complicated when you're a researcher you're not just you know someone who's trying to objectively hear information but working within a community you're also representing the field of research right so what does that really mean in that context what, what is the model of conduct you should do because it's not just about boundaries it's about empathy and support and all of those other principles and so here's quotes about that These were one on one, I believe, I'm 90% sure they're one on one yeah. interviews. Yeah. And again, you know, so the other thing that's interesting too is, and you see some conflicts in these, not every research subject is going to feel the same way about your role as a researcher or your interaction, which means you are guaranteed to get it wrong, right? You're also guaranteed to get it right, but that's, you know, how you manage that. And to some degree, we all do this <laughs> interpersonally and we do it in our work as well, where you, you, you interact differently with people in different relationships. So you can act differently with different research subjects. Um, you will have to negotiate acting differently when you're in the community versus you're not in the community, or you'll separate the two. But with different individuals, they have different expectations and different perspectives. So there's no, you know, one of the things that's true of, I mean, it's true of research in general, but it's really true of ethics, is there is no right answer and no right way, because it's, it's always a negotiation. So I think this is the, oh, one more. So following rules. So this is interesting because everyone says you got to follow the rules. Um, and somebody even says like the whole, all of civilization depends on its rules, right? <laughs> that first quote. So people do see that. And, and so, but yet there are plenty of people, plenty of research certainly who would argue and argue convincingly that sometimes you have to break the rules, right? So again, what do participants think? And for all of the MRPs, all of these issues, I mean, you're not gonna go and do this with necessarily with your MRP, but these are the kinds of questions that per participant perspectives are really going to reflect um, the decisions you have to make, and they're going to argue on both sides. I mean, that's the thing: is there is not going to be a uniform. There may be uh, someone, you know, participants who say, you know, don't come in here with with you know the HIV testing on site. Like we don't want that. Like people may have a, a, a unanimous or near unanimous opinion for that. But in terms of your role and ability to work in a place, people are going to have different opinions, and how we negotiate that is a real challenge. And I think the idea behind research ethics is, is putting that out there in the foreground, just saying these are the things we have to negotiate, and then coming up with, in most cases, the best possible solution. Well, I keep thinking it's over, and there's another one. I should have <laughs> memorized how many there are. Pragmatic self-interest. This will be sort of obvious to us. Take care of yourself. Right. Make sure, as a researcher, you don't do something that's so egregious or so well-meaning that you damage your ability to do research, right? So there is a there is this interesting. I'm just going to cheat. Okay. So there is this. There's no eight. There is this interesting sort of dynamic of of. And now these are re these are participants who've been in research studies before, who implicitly at least recognize the value of the research enterprise. And it's not the value of the research enterprise that you know. In, in some cities, Baltimore, this is the case. New York, this used to be the case. I think it still is. You can make a, a small career being involved in research studies because there's so much research going on. This is not that type of self-interest. This is that there's a value in people doing this work, um, which I think participants see. And so having them work as experts to help you cr sort of craft that work in a way that's most likely to be effective um, and beneficial and follow these principles it's not that we know this and we have to educate people. Participants implicitly get the value of these studies. They also get the harm of being excluded from some of these studies. So that, you know, I often find, I'm sure you all often find that participants know a lot more than you thought they knew. Like they really do, like drug users are amazing at chemistry, 
right? I took chemistry, I was okay. Drug users really have figured out, people have navigated strategies to deal with social problems that I would not be able to deal with in, in two minutes I'd be in trouble and people figure out ways of navigating their environment. So tapping into that expertise, again, and part of that expertise is people recognizing the value of some of the knowledge that you're trying to get. That's not to say they recognize the value of all research. It's to say that, you know, sort of community-based participatory research people can get on board with. I don't know if you ask this about clinical trials. I suspect you'd get a lot of quotes of, yeah, they're useful, but they don't affect me. They're never going to get to my community. But the types of research we're talking about, I think people see that. And then basically the idea is just that people do apply these principles contextually. So, so the ones that were co co showed up more in coding were different in, in, different, situ in different scenarios. So the sort of take home message, I think we all know this, doesn't always hurt to say it, that drug users are moral agents, that they have agency, that they take responsibility. Um, that in this context, although you might not define it that way, or they might not define it that way, they're really addressing these complex moral and ethical issues. And that by asking them their, for their involvement, they're really wrestling with these same things, most often in natural language, which frankly makes a lot more sense than the language we typically use in, in research and in ethics anyway. Like people are really wrestling with those issues. And they understand and really share with research the value of doing research ethically, which I think is, is it's not surprising that they think we should do things ethically. It's, it, it's, it always seems a little surprising that if we ask people, they could, they could be around this table and would be talking about some of the similar things that we're talking about. Um, and that they include not just the Belmont principles where all this started, but also include other aspects um, of the research relationship. And it's different in context, which I think is, makes sense. And that's the three scenarios were very different contexts to sort of illustrate that. I think we'll skip lessons learned and move on to discussion. Right, we all know, we, we know, well, let's look at this. I mean, one of the things we need to do, and we've talked about this, and you probably all do this implicitly, although it will somewhat come up more explicitly because of the focus of the MRP, is, is to really be aware of the expectations. You know, so what Celia talked about yesterday about understanding things and then acknowledging risks and benefits and, and, and things like that is really having that be part of how you frame your questions and then going back to it so that it becomes a part of the relationship that researchers can go back and say, do you, do you understand you know, what you might say is the boundaries, but more important, do you understand what we're doing? Do you understand the risks you're taking on? May or may not come up in your MRPs because if it's a cross-sectional study, you don't necessarily go back and revisit, um, but, but at times it may come up because you're engaged in the community and you come up with your cab that might understand, although your cab you probably only meet a few times, but does the community understand what you're doing as you're doing it, and does that understanding shift or not as you're carrying out your study? And good luck with this one, avoiding personal and professional boundaries. That's really the challenge because the better, I mean, I, I'll take the bias that ethnographic research is the best type of research, but the more you do it, the, you're, you're sort of pushing against the limit. And if you're pushing against the limit of that boundary, it's really easy to step over and have to step back. So, you know, your tri ethnographic research and some of the work we're doing tries to operate in that gray area, which is really hard to do. But it's really important because that's where participants can give you the best information. So this is something that's an ongoing issue and something you know, that's worth thinking about. Some of the previous, there was a, I mentioned this yesterday, Rebecca Fielding Miller did an MRP looking at the researcher's experience and harms to researchers by asking all these sensitive questions all the time. And one of her findings was really having a support system for researchers. So a way for people to check in about these boundaries throughout the course of a study as part of your team meetings or whatever you're doing is really important. Trust and care I think is obvious to all of us. Confidentiality, I mean, we know this, this is gonna be a challenge. A lot of the MRPs you're talking about are gonna take place in public venues. So what does that mean in terms of confidentiality and protecting that? Those are things that we'll wrestle with. And, and, and again, what are participants' expectations and perceptions and having that discussion as part of the informed consent process. Justice and fairness. You know, we're all going to wrestle with this in terms of some more than others in terms of we're working with populations and, and participants who are 
the victims of huge injustice that we're not going to fix in the course of one study, but can the study be a little sort of island of fairness in the midst of, of things and, and at least kind of approach it that way. Um, and that participants, I mean, again, I think you know this, participants expect you to act, et act ethically and fairly. I think the, the fact that you're here means you've kind of crossed that hurdle and that you already pay attention to it because it's something you have to check back in and pay attention to all the time. Um, we're not really doing random as well. Some of us may be, but obviously you explain the reasons for random assignment during informed consent, make sure that people understand or seem to understand. Um, I tend to be a little skeptical about reform consent really that people I mean the things I sign the boxes I check so I am always a little hesitant to say that anybody really gets it um, all we've talked about for the last day and a half is about looking at things through the participant lens so I think that's sort of what's interesting and that's what you keep getting pushed at in in your MRPs and in all the discussion is what do people think what do they think about that what do participants think about that what is their view of the thing you're doing or the thing you're proposing how do they understand what you're asking them to do? How do they weigh? What are their risks and benefits? It's really all about looking through a participant lens. And that obviously participants can help you, but they don't make, the, you have to make your own ethical decisions. Um, and there will be times where those ethical decisions come in conflict, like some of those examples in some of those cases. Um, and you still have to maintain your own personal and professional ethics and then figure out how to communicate that to participants. Although at least this study shows that people can understand that. Um, and when participants are involved, it really lends a, a weight and a positive, you know, it puts a lot of strength in the methods and in the studies and the findings that you're doing. Um, and so you'll hear us push about, you know, expert panels and participant, you know, input to research um, and talking directly to participants throughout the institute. And that's the, I guess that's the concluding slide. 